Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 231. So in this video you're basically getting a two-for-one special because we are going to be talking about two chapters, chapter 5 and chapter 10, both of which uh, involve plotting equations in MATLAB. Uh, chapter 5 is all about plotting two-dimensional equations and chapter 10 is all about plotting three-dimensional equations. It's going to be a very brief look at these chapters, so uh, don't expect anything super hardcore or anything. Uh, we're just I'm just going to introduce some uh, functions that will be pretty useful later on. So without further ado, let's talk about plotting two-dimensional functions. And the first function I have right here is plot. So plot basically takes in two vectors. So in this case right here, we have uh, plot will take in an x vector and a y vector, and we'll plot a bunch of points where um, basically it goes through the entries of every vector and, and it assigns them to x, y coordinates. So plot right here will assign the points 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, 4, 8, all the way through to 8, 16. Then what it tries to do is it tries to extrapolate a, a, an equation between those all those points that it uh, created in the vector. So if you take a look at what happens, uh, if you want to see the results of plotting, what you'll do is you'll run MATLAB and out pops uh, the figure window right here. So the figure window has a lot of tools that we won't really be taking too much advantage of in this class at least. But one thing that is really useful is that you can click uh, you can click on your plot and get different values of points right here. So yep, here's another one right here at 3 and 6, there's 5 and 10, here's 4 and 8, and so on. So while there's a line between all of these uh, points, like what looks like a solid line, the only points that are actually showing up are the ones that we defined in our uh, words in our MATLAB. And what I'm realizing is that the figure window hasn't actually shown up for y'all, so let me try to fix that in one sec. Okay, so I have the figure window up for y'all, and you can see actually where I have each of these points selected. So like I said before and failed to demonstrate, I can select and deselect any of these points right here if I want to see the value. So I can get rid of this if it's cluttering things up. And I can add some of them if I want to see some of the actual individual points that I defined. So again, what I'll say is that note that I can define x equals 7, y equals 14. I can define x equals 6, y equals 12. I can't do anything in between them because of the way that I defined the vector. So if you look back at the vector right there, what I did was I sort of created all of these points. I, I basically created eight points in MATLAB manually or automatically did the equation in between those points. So basically MATLAB will only let me select the points that I actually specify myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close out that figure window and we're going to take a look at another example right here. Here what I did was I made a similar input vector. This one takes all uh, x values from 1 to 16 and basically I'm plotting the equation y equals x squared. So the x, uh, the x um, vector is going to have all the numbers 1 through 16, and the y vector is going to have everything from 1 squared to 16 squared. So we can take a look at this one now. Let me pull that up on the recording. There we go. So we have this nice parabolic function based on just due to the fact that I was able to define our input and output vectors based on this uh, y equals x squared equation. So that's a that's the uh, plot function. It's nice and simple. All right, so the next function I want to talk is the f plot function. Uh, and the f plot function, it does get into a little bit of detail that, um, not that we haven't covered yet. So Actually, once we talk about chapter 7, once we finish talking about chapter 7, you'll want to return to this point in the video to uh, talk about f-plot. So mark this. I would mark this down in your notes uh, that f-plot requires chapter 7. But basically what f-plot does is it can take in a, uh, an actual function defined in a very specific way that MATLAB does it called, a, called an anonymous function. 
and a set of limits. So what I've done here is basically this is the MATLAB way of saying I'm going to give you a function that takes in input x. So the at means just some mathematical function and the x in parentheses right here is the input. And everything after here is just what you do with the input x. So in this case, I'm trying to basically plot f of x equals x, x sine of x uh, for all values between 0 and 10 pi. So if we take a look at what happens when we run this, oh, one sec, what we get is a nice little continuous function like so. And this actually, as you can see, as I move along here, we actually have a lot more points defined. And the reason why is because this function hasn't graphed continuously rather than being based on a uh, being based on a specific set of vectors. So this is a really nice way of much more precisely graphing a function. So at the time of this video, since you haven't covered chapter seven just yet, if you want to, um, if you want to graph a function very precisely, all you have to do is, let me comment this out really quick. Uh, let's say you're trying to graph uh, y equals the square root of x. All you would have to do is type in f plot um, at uh, in parentheses x, there's so left parenthesis x, right parenthesis, and then the function that you want to do. So in this case, we want to do square root of x and then just the bounds that you want to do. So uh, I'm going to say starting at zero, uh, negative square root's bad. And then going to, let's say 100. And once we do this, we'll see that we have this nice square root of x graph where x goes from zero to 100 and y goes from zero to 10. So that's the f plot function for you. It's a very nice way of graphing complicated equations that, you know, well, just if you have the equation for it, you can graph it using f plot. So I would use the, um, the sort of at and x thing. Just consider that boilerplate for the time being. Just put it in there for now. And in chapter seven, we'll talk about what all of that actually means. So stay tuned for that. It's a pretty exciting conversation, actually. So now what I want you to do is uh, return your attention to plot right here. And notice now I have four vectors plotted in here. Now let's take a look at what happens here when I have you know these four vectors. And you can see that I have two different colors of line right here. One is the equation y equals 2x, and the other is the equation y equals x squared. And you can see that right here. Uh, if a is all x's from 1 to 16, I have a and 2a. So this maps everything in a to two times everything in a. And then this maps everything in a to everything in a squared. So you can actually stack in multiple vectors like these. As long as you have an even number of vectors, uh, then you're able to create multiple graphs like this. Now, notice, um, I'm going to close this out really quick. Notice what happens when I only have three vectors like this. And you'll see the error uh, data must be a single matrix Y or a list of pairs X, Y. The problem that's going on here is basically there's three, uh, there's three vectors in here and it's looking for the fourth vector to basically associate as the Y values to the X values for everything in the second copy of A. So you have to, if you're graphing multiple lines using plot, you have to use uh, an even number of vectors in there. That's just something pretty important. All right, so for this next section, uh, you can probably see that I've re-enabled this uh, f plot of the equation x sine x. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how to format that plot because if you take a look at the uh, graph for x sine x, there's not really much going on here. I mean, we have axis labels and that's it, which any of you who have taken a uh, really any sort of class like, I don't know, chemistry or physics with any sort of strict teacher will know that, well, a graph like this, you know, this isn't enough information. We have to label the x-axis, we have to label the y-axis, we have to have a title at the very least. So we can do that using a plot formatting command. So there's three that are really going to be the most useful right here. There's x-label, there's y-label, and there's title. 
And I think these are the ones that we're going to use the most. So X label, Y label, and title all take in strings. And those strings are going to represent what title is going to be put next to the X axis label, Y axis label, and title respectively. So X label could be something like um, X values, we, could, we can say. Y label could be something like uh, X sign X. I don't know, just spitballing here. And and for the title, we could say something like a uh, really cool graph of X sign X. Close that out and let's see what this does to our graph. And all of a sudden, the graph looks a lot easier. We have, we have our title, we have the X and Y axis labels and stuff like that. So it makes things a lot nicer to really format your plots using X and Y labels and your title. So something to keep in mind for your submissions. You, you'll probably need these quite a bit. Okay, so now let's say I want to create the, uh, the Chapter 5 Example Graph Cinematic Universe Spectacular, where... Basically, I want to take all of these graphs and put them into a single plot. Well, what happens if I run if I just run this? And you'll see that only one of these showed up. In this case, it's just the line y equals 2x from 8 to 16. So what if I want all of these in sort of the same window? Well, there's a really nice command for that. That's called subplot. So subplot basically takes m, n, and p. And what subplot does is M and N define a sort of grid for how many, for like the shape of the graphs next to each other. So if I do something like subplot two and two, this is going to make a two by two grid of graphs. And then finally, P selects the, uh, the current graph in consideration. So P is basically going to select graphs left to right, up to down, uh, up and down, sort of like uh, the direction you would sort of look at the graphs if you're reading them you know left to right up and down so in this case if i want the first graph to be the y equals 2x graph i can do subplot 2 2 1 and then type out this plot right here and it'll put this plot command the output of this plot command in the upper left corner and i'll say something like subplot 2 2 2 the two right here says that, okay, now we're moving on to the next spot in the subplot. This one, we'll put it in the upper right corner. And then it will calculate all of that. And then we'll have a subplot two, two, three. And in this one, we'll put X sine X and I'll leave two, two, four blank and see what happens here. So now when I run this, we have some problems. And that problem happens to be because I forgot to remove this mistake from last time. So my apologies, let's try running it again. And when we do, we see three graphs lined up right next to each other with a space for one more. But now let's say instead of making them in a vague square kind of shape, let's say I wanna do them side by side. So let me change two and two to one and three. So we'll put them all basically on the same row. So in this case, M controls the number of rows, P controls the number of columns, sort of like what we might expect from talking about matrices this whole time. So now we're, we're uh, sort of creating a horizontal column, uh, I guess a row of graphs like this. You can do the same if you swap the positions of the three and the one in each of the subplot commands, we can make vertical uh, columns of graphs. So these are the most useful uh, 2D plotting. These are the most uh, useful 2D plotting functions in here. Now let's take a quick look at the 3D plotting functions. All right, so here's our next function. Um, plot three takes in a X vector, a Y vector, and a Z vector, much like how plot two worked. So for this, what I'm going to do is a, I have a pretty complicated example. This is the one from the textbook. And this will basically create a really cool spiral. So what I've done is I've sort of done this T to represent a whole bunch of values from one to six pi separated by 0 0.1. Then X I said is going to be the square root of T times sine two T. 
y is the square root of t times cosine of 2t, and z is 0 0.5 times t. So what you might remember from some of our calculus classes and maybe some physics or other applications of this is that I parameterized, parameterized x, y, and z in terms of some value t. And this actually lets us create some really cool shapes like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot this and we can see what happens. And as it turns out, I forgot to remove all the subplot stuff. So let me get rid of this really quick, run it again. And yeah, oh, no, my apologies. I don't know. There we go. Now it works. So now we have this really cool spiral right here. Of course, it's a little tricky to understand what's going on. So this is where uh, our labels are going to come in handy. So I'm going to do X label, uh, just make it simple. X, Y label, Y. And there's also the command Z label, which is a label for the Z axis. Another thing we can do is we can type in grid on. And grid on is basically just going to turn on a grid for our uh, figure. So I'm going to get rid of this and try it again. And here we go. This looks a lot easier to read. So this is basically just the plot three function right here. All right, so let's say we, now that we want to make a three-dimensional mesh or a three-dimensional surface. So preparing this one is going to be a little bit tricky, but basically what we have for a mesh or a surface is we'll have a two-dimensional plane, X and Y, that basically uniformly covers all sorts of, uh, all sorts of points on the XY plane. And then we decide to, we decide what Z is in terms of uh, the positions at X and Y. So that gives us a really nice three-dimensional mesh right here. So the example I'm working off of in the textbook is page 326. So you might want to follow along with that. What I'm first going to do is declare sort of the boundaries for the mesh. So where in the coordinate plane are X and Y sort of boundaries are going to exist. So X we're going to say is every, uh, every whole integer number from negative one to three. Uh, y is going to be every whole number from one to four. And then if we want to basically create a uh, X and Y and here, uh, before I forget about it, like I did last time, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. Uh, if we want to create a uh, basically a matrix of all possible combinations of X and Y, what we can do is we can say that X, Y equals mesh grid x, y. So uppercase x and y is going to equal lowercase x and y. So we can take a look at what happens here when we just run this command without uh, producing any output. And basically what we have is a whole bunch of the x and y values. And if you sort of, um, basically you can kind of combine these together and to sort of form a rectangle of uh, words to sort of form the boundaries of uh, our to form the boundaries of the mesh. So actually, if you turn this, uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, this mesh grid right here, basically, it's a grid mesh. What this does is it, it's actually you know what we can do is we can show what the mesh grid looks like by itself. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very quick uh, z equals one, like so. Let's see if I can do a mesh x y z. Yeah, just see what happens. I'm kind of throwing stuff to the wind right here. Ah, this isn't gonna work. Okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna plow through with the example, and we can see uh, how things turn out. So what's going to happen is um, <clears throat> in order to calculate a mesh or surface, what we have to do is we have to define Z in terms of X and Y in some point. So let's say something like, uh, I'm going to use a whole bunch of matrix operations. So Z equals X uh, uh, element by element multiplication, X times Y uh, squared uh, divided by X squared plus 
y squared. So again, I'm doing this based off of the example starting on page 326 in the textbook. So just taking a look at what happens when we do mesh of x, y, and z. Let's see how this all works out. I believe there's an error here, so we have to figure out what I did wrong. And you know, I just forgot to do some element by element operations there. My apologies. Okay, so what we have is a real funky mesh like this. Now I'm going to try to break this down for you. You can see on the bottom, um, you can see sort of on the Cartesian plane hiding underneath the uh, Z mesh is you can see this grid going from negative one to three on X and one to four on Y. So let me actually uh, do some axis labels here. So X axis equals X, Y. Oh, sorry, that should be X label, my bad. X label equals X, Y label equals Y, and Z label equals Z. My lab's not happy about something. Nope, it's happy about something. Okay. Let's rerun this. You can see down here that this, uh, oh, no, it's still not happy about something. Hang on. Okay, apparently it doesn't want to display the labels. That's fine. But you can see, basically, along, along the uh, x-coordinate is... Words. You can see that the x-coordinate stretches from negative 1 to 3, and the y-coordinate stretches from 1 to 4. And in along these sort of... Um, along this rectangle here is every point combination between... Uh, so that we can, we can basically combine every x, y, where x is between negative 1 and 3, and y is between 1 and 4. And then what we have is we have z defined in terms of every single x and y combination here. And what that gives us is this really nice three-dimensional mesh, where z is, uh, in fact, determined by the height of this mesh, or sorry, the z value is determined by its x and y positioning right here. So that's a mesh. Uh, we call it a mesh because it kind of looks like a fishnet. We have all these lines connected with an uh, open space, which are these uh, white areas here. But let's say that instead of doing a mesh, we want to do a filled in surface. So what we can actually do instead, rather than saying mesh, is we can say surf. With exact that takes in exactly the same parameters, an x vector, y, sorry, an x matrix, y matrix, and z matrix. When we run that, now these are filled in, representing that this is a solid surface. If it was white, it would represent a mesh. Because it's filled in with color, it represents a solid surface. Okay, so there's one more command right here. It's surf l. And function is pretty much the same as surf, except for the fact that you put an l here. And what this means is that it's basically the surf command, but it actually provides some lighting. Uh, it, simu it simulates lighting here. So if we run this example using surf L instead of surf, you'll see that things are a little bit lighter. Um, so it's providing some sort of simulated lighting on top of this mesh. So let's take a look at surf L with a, a little bit more interesting of an example. And this one I'm actually basing off of... Uh, page 330's example right here. Okay, so here is Surf L, which I'm, with a much more interesting example right here. Uh, and, you know, this is a very well-lit uh, mesh like so. But let's take a look at the difference between Surf L and Surf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a subplot of one, basically a one row, two column subplot. Actually, let's say a two row, one column subplot. For the first one, I'll basically do surf x, y, z. And for the second, I'll do our surf l, x, y, z. So you can see the difference between the two. And if I run that, like so, you can see sort of the change in lighting right here uh, between the two. And basically, surf l kind of, it does help with... Um, sort of creating a perspective of depth that you can see like the warm lighting on top as it kind of sinks into the uh, of, of the uh, sorry the warm lighting on top of the second 
graph as it sinks into the uh, dip. And then you can see where it sinks into the dip much clearer because of the dark lighting that is uh, sort of on the bottom of this graph. So Surfell, super useful for making graphs uh, a little more 3D. So that's a very brief overview of chapters 5 and 10. Um, I highly recommend just going through those uh, uh, going through those chapters by yourself. because so I did skip over a few functions that might be useful, but um, these are the ones that I think will be the most helpful for you to take a look at. All right. Thank you all so much for watching.